times over as soon as his inheritance is arrived. Hello? Hello, this is Tina here from the yeah. International. Oh, hello, yes. Has your dad died yet? No. No, 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 he hasn't, I'm afraid. Percy was 21 and married to Harriet. But when he visited Godwin, Mary, who was now 16, was back from Dundee and living in London, somewhere in that uninteresting building there. Percy was immediately captivated by her enthusiasm for science and for the French Revolution. One night they went for a walk by her mother's grave in St Pancras, and it seems that's where Percy announced his love for Mary, and where they made love for the first time. Now, I know it can be tough when you're young and in love with nowhere to go, and I don't want to appear unsympathetic to liberal views on these matters, but... On your mother's grave! I wonder if she went, here, yeah, I don't want you to think I normally like shag on my mother's grave on a first date and everything, because I normally like make sure that it's a stranger's grave, because I'm not that sort of girl. Percy gave Mary his copy of his poem, Queen Mad, and she wrote in it... I love the author beyond all powers of expression. I am thine, exclusively thine, by the kiss of love. A common attitude towards her relationship with Shelley is that she was the cute girl in the background while he discussed politics with his friends. But in fact, Percy loved her partly because she was one of the few people who could debate with him at his own level. But his first wife, Harriet, wouldn't agree to a legal separation. And then, Percy and Mary were discussing a joint suicide, which was only disturbed when her stepmother burst into Mary's room and discovered them with a gun and a bottle of laudanum. Oh, I told you to knock! Hello, Mrs. Godwin. So one night at four in the morning, Mary, Percy and her half-sister Claire slipped out of the house and ran away to France on a fisherman's boat. This would have seemed outrageous whatever Mary's age. But to leg it with a 16-year-old, when he was already married, he was lucky he wasn't brought back on the next boat with a crowd whipped up by the Daily Express swimming alongside going, You're scum! The incredible maturity of the pair was broken just occasionally. For example, by Mary's diary entry about Calais. We saw with ecstasy the strange costume of the French women and read with delight the descriptions in our passports and heard little boys and girls talking French. In other words, wow, we're abroad! Because the first time you go away, it just seems fantastic that people really are actually different. I remember going up to someone and saying, excusez-moi, uh, je cherche la banque. And they said, ah, tu cherches la banque, n'est-ce pas? Vous allez te doigt. And I just thought, wow, it's fantastic. You make these weird noises and they know what you mean. To continue on their travels, they bought a donkey and the three set off to Switzerland, walking while the donkey carried their bags. But the donkey collapsed and they had to exchange it for a mule. And when they went to trade it in, they probably said, oh, look at that, it's two old donkeys welded together. Eventually it became apparent that they weren't going to be able to live in Switzerland with no money and a mule, so they headed back towards England in a boat up the Rhine. And on Mary's 17th birthday, they stopped at the house of... <coughs> The Frankensteins. By the time they got back to England, they'd run out of money completely and had to borrow a rowing boat and row it up the Thames. Percy and Mary moved in together in London, but all society was disgusted by their behaviour. They had to move house every few weeks and meet in disguise at pre-arranged points as they were being chased by bailiffs. Even Godwin started legal proceedings against Percy for the money that he'd been promised for writing. Then it turned out that Percy's wife Harriet was pregnant and then Mary became pregnant but the baby was born prematurely and didn't survive and she wrote in her diary Dreamed that my little baby came to life again. It had only been cold so he rubbed it by the fire and it lived. Following all this disaster Mary moved to Bristol partly to get out of the way of people who thought that this tragedy served her right and while she was there, she went through another experience that shaped the book that changed her life. Slavery had been abolished, but there were thousands of ex-slaves still living in Bristol who were treated as subhuman. She met prominent people who argued that African people were somehow midway between humans and monkeys. Mary's brush with this world left her horrified at the way human beings could judge other people on the basis of what they looked like. At this point, her half-sister Claire started going out with Lord Byron, and she suggested they all went on a trip to Geneva. 
This is often portrayed as a drug-crazed degenerate celebs holiday. And partly this just fits in with the attitude towards drugs in this country, which is so full of hypocrisy, especially in this place. And you might have expected it from the Tories, because they were all about 70, but new Labour, they're all 50 and went to university in the 60s, and they all say, well, I certainly never tried drugs. You liars, I bet you spent your whole adolescence in a big puff of smoke. And every now and again they get one to come on and say, well, I did try it once, but I didn't really like it, so I never tried it again. Rubbish! If you decide to take drugs and you try one and you don't like it, you just try another one, don't you? You might as well say, oh, I tried food once, it was a scotch egg, didn't like it, never ate another thing for the rest of my life. When's one of them going to be honest and say, have I tried drugs, Sir David? Have I? Go on, have you ever done the hot knives? Go on, with the milk bottle and the bottom cut out. I thought my lungs were going to burst. Anyway, back to the European single currency. But the main attraction for them in coming to this spot was to discuss radical ideas, as they were all in despair at how the poor were being brutalised and Britain was becoming a police state. But I'm not sure your average weaver would have thought, I'll tell you the first thing what needs to be put right, is poets need to have more holidays. Yeah. Then one night during a storm, Byron suggested they all try to write a ghost story. And the next day, Mary wrote a tale just a few pages long and Percy urged her to turn it into a complete book. And the book that became Frankenstein was finished when they came back to England in the town of Marlow in Buckinghamshire. And I'm sure Percy and Mary would appreciate that now the first thing you see when you leave Shelley Cottage is a tub of withered flowers commemorating the Golden Jubilee. It's worth noting here that Frankenstein wasn't the monster, he was the doctor who created the monster, which has caused so much confusion. Especially for the poor sods really called Frankenstein that Shelley got the name off in the first place. They must have spent the rest of their lives hearing people say... I'm afraid we're fully booked for the next six months, Mr Frankenstein. <sighs> Thousands of academics have debated the issue of what's it all about. So you get stuff like... A sense of persecution represents the fearful phantasmic rejection by recasting of an original homosexual desire making sense to think of Frankenstein as embodying strongly homophobic mechanisms. Don't you wish you could be at the lectures of one of these people just so you could put your hand up and go, it's about a bloody monster! These people could watch Teletubbies and go, oh, Lala's search for the ball indicates an unhappiness with the size of his own genitals. Someone should cause academic mayhem by arguing that the monster was gay.